name is Karl Schweitzer. Um, I co-founded Torque and I'm involved with chocolate making, cacao, like most of us at Torque. Um, and besides that, my, let's say, specific role or expertise is the brand management of Torque and everything design related. Uh, my name is James LeConte. I'm a business partner and uh, official title is CEO. And yeah, I'm currently residing in Australia and my day-to-day -day role um, is really around sales, digital marketing, um, strategy. And so that touches on all sorts of areas. You know, at the moment we're doing quite a bit on new, new product development. So that's an exciting part of the job. So, James, I know that you are Australian by birth, mm -hmm. and um, Carl, you are Austrian by birth. That's a weird <laughs> coincidence, I'm sure. But how did the two of you first meet each other? Do you want to do you want to go ahead, James? You were a visitor. <laughs> sure. Um, well, Toak has three co-founders, so that um, I guess that's the prelude to. When Carl and I met, the, uh, Carl is one of them. Carl's wife, Denise uh, Valencia, who's from Quito, and Jerry Toth, who uh, I'm not sure if you've met Jerry, but I know you've corresponded. Um, Jerry is originally from the Chicago area. Um, there's a story about how the three of them met um, and started TOAC, but in terms of how Carl or how I met the, the team at TOAC, um, I had been working for, I guess at that point, about seven years in international development, um, basically in, in the field of microfinance, um, supporting small businesses and, and agri, agri businesses um, or smallholder farmers in the Asia and Asia Pacific region with an Australian NGO. And uh, yeah, I wanted to make a career move. Um, my wife is from Ecuador, and so we were planning to also make a geographical move and move the family to Ecuador. And um, yeah, I'd been fascinated by chocolate since I was a kid, um, particularly dark chocolate. And yeah, I, I, you know, my, my father-in-law has had a cacao farm for the, well he just sold it recently but he had had one for about the last 20 or 25 years in Ecuador and so when we would go back and visit him um, you know we would get to spend a bit of time on a cacao farm and I got to you know learn about the if you like the the value chain of uh, chocolate and cacao um, and decided that was you know the the career move that I wanted to make um, and from there it was for me a matter of you know um, getting to know people in the in the industry in Ecuador and I um, saw well I, I heard about TOAC quite a bit in the media and just reached out to the team um, and at that point you know we had the opportunity to meet in person in Ecuador um, and uh, and then I basically for the next two years I think it was from around 2015 to 2017 um, I did you know provided some pro bono support and in, in sales and and strategy and and that type of thing particularly in the asia region and in return i learned about chocolate making and uh, and the chocolate industry and then um, yeah an opportunity came up where the team invited me to come on board formally um sort of at the end of 2016 i think it was and in 2017 um you know we quit our jobs and we moved to ecuador <laughs> yeah, I still remember the first encounter. It was at Serbia's farm, it was harvest time, and mm -hmm. we sat together. On... Serbia is one of our colleagues, and he's um, also a partner in Toak. He's fourth generation cacao grower, and he has this little, really romantic, um, like ecological farm in Manabi, uh, in the province at the coast of Ecuador. And so we sat around his table with James, Rita, and Celeste, his uh, daughter. Uh, she was back then she was like four years right like uh, yeah maybe not even right now. She would, yeah three, three yeah three maybe four mm -hmm. and i think celeste celeste told us that her daddy wants to mm -hmm. wants to work at toag or like do something with toag or whatever 
Like she, she immediately she let, got, she let the, cat, the, the cat out of the bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, out of the out of the mouths of babes, as they say. Yeah. Well, uh, so I think that I first ran across your chocolate or Coac chocolate uh, while it was still may still may have been in development. I was at the Salon del Cacao y Chocolate in Lima mm -hmm. in 2014, and mm -hmm. Italy Farfan. Mm -hmm. Italy Farfan would have been tasting around some mm -hmm. chocolate that she was working on or had oh, yeah, somehow yeah, yeah. involved with. That. And I think that that might have been the first time I tasted what you were doing, even though nobody had any idea. Um, although, I, not that no, any, nobody had any idea, but that Italy would not share what it was <laughs> that she was working on. She left it. Um, oh, really? <laughs> she left it to all of us. And um, I, I'm, you know, I'm scouring through my notes and I'm looking through the four boxes that you sent to me. And I noticed that in the harvest, um, 2014 is the first harvest that's shared here. So mm, that's a nice question. How, yeah. how long had you been making chocolate um, or how long had you been, you know, working with the beans and, and having chocolate made from them um, before you felt like you got to the point that you actually had a chocolate that you felt really, really good about and they wanted to share with the world? I think it was about a year, if I remember correctly, because we met Jerry in February 2013 and started like, Jerry had all the energy. He was kind of ready and um, really wanted to move on from, not move on, but his nonprofit project with the reserve um, was already up and running after seven years and he was ready to to create you know a business and uh like like everyone who starts a business wants to see it <laughs> um up and running as soon as possible so i remember we you know one of the things after the the, the initial phase of just knowing each other and, and everything settled um we started to investigate the world of cacao, interview a lot of people and travel around Ecuador. And we, I remember we, we did chocolate with Salinerito, for example. We visited Bios, which is, um, I believe, probably the oldest uh, chocolate making company in Ecuador, founded by, by someone from Germany, um, the Ulgisa family. And yeah, we also came across Ecuadorian Chocolates and the and Idali, and we we did experiments with Idali as well. So we started to do chocolate like pretty much from the beginning, and it took us, I would say, roughly a year. I mean, to go to market, it was more because we sold our first bar in October, two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Which, which begins to make sense if I was in Peru in June or July right, and Adali shared things around and saying mm -hmm. this. So this actually might have been part of the earliest production, which eventually got turned into a bar. That's yeah, that's likely. We did several rounds of, of tests, um, uh, even like with the cacao genetics. Uh, so we separated them uh, since the early days. We've learned a lot since then, but um yeah then at the end we decided you know that batch is gonna make it into our first bar so when did so when did the concept of um um aging and aging not only in terms of vintages because one of the boxes i have is um, a selection of six different harvest years and so you have a, a main harvest and an off harvest and so i'm guessing that's the difference between the rain harvest and the el nino harvest what we would normally think right Mm. Is that a good mm. assumption? Oh, it's mm. a, well, we do an annual harvest um, around sort of the period between February to May, depending on the season uh, that year. And the El Nino harvest was uh, given that name because of the weather phenomenon that year. But uh, every other year it would be the you know, 2017 rain harvest, 2018 rain harvest, 2015 rain harvest. The, the only other exception is in 2015, we did two different versions of the harvest, um, 
basically changing some of the fermentation time, uh, roast mm -hmm. and pick our percentage and conch. And that sort of thing. So, so I noticed, I noticed on this um, harvest selection box um, that it is the one that doesn't have tasting notes on it. The other ones have, have tasting notes uh, on them. Actually, I take that back. Um, the harvest and aged, which has got the Palo Santo and the, and the, and the, the Campo pepper and the Isla malt um, also doesn't have also doesn't have tasting notes um, on the outside of the you box. You mean on the yeah on the outside of the box on the mm -hmm. outside on the outside of the box. I mean it's it you know I resisted all attempts right <laughs> to open up these boxes since they arrived um, a couple of days ago. Um, a very very difficult uh, and all. But I also noticed um, you know all of the harvests are at different percentages. So, mm -hmm. um, so I have a 2014 rain harvest at 81%, a 2015 um, light at 73%, also rain harvest. Uh, so uh, there is, so if you can just walk me through some of the creative thinking, some of the creative process, how the decisions get made to be able to um, decide this harvest needs this percentage as opposed, or this much sugar or this much roast or however, compared with, with um, previous harvests. Who does that, mm -hmm. how it's done? It's done mostly by the whole team. Um, at the beginning, it was uh, Denise, Jerry and myself. I, I love the part a lot, Jerry does as well. So usually also because Jerry and I have been you know, close to the chocolate making process, closer than, than my wife often. Um, it's kind of on the team a bit like Jerry and I um, analyze the, the flavor profile. But then, for example, James also uh, chips in and, uh, and Denise and anyone else on the team. Um, to give you an example, with the Galapagos harvest, for example, um, what we did is and, and that's very similar to all the other editions. We just try to do um, experiments uh, from the very beginning. Like uh, the early days were pretty tough because we did so many experiment, experiments with starting with fermentation, like actually starting with DNA, like picking the cacao, but well, now we know much more than, than back then. Um, then the fermentation, we tried, you know, all different styles and times and even different wood types. Um, um, but then when it comes to, let's say, once the beans are ready, like dry and, and here in Quito, we simply uh, roast a small batch and do different roast styles. We taste them, we you know analyze how flavor profiles come through. Then um, we do different little liquor batches and just analyze how the liquor comes along. Um, we do that with small machines. We also do it um, at uh, many cases, like at the, a small lab that Equatoriana Chocolates has in Quito, um, or with anyone else. We did, for example, Galapagos with Nativa Romas from Cayambe. Um, El Nino was done together with Vicente Norero from Camino Verde. Um, so we did it with his lab machine. So it's pretty much almost the same process. We just, you know, try a lot of different uh, things uh, to get to know the, the harvest a bit better. And then, then it's a bit of, an, of a question of, I guess that's for us, the art of making chocolate. You decide, well, you know, what's what's interesting about this harvest? Um, and then also we, we compared with other harvests we had, um, so if we can, for example, like with 2018, uh, we decided at the end to highlight floral a bit more. So we could have conched it longer, but we did a very short conch time just because the floral uh, was amazing and we, we considered not conching it at all. Then the floral would, would have been very powerful. But then the feedback from the team, we even involved, you know, whoever we're working with at that point, the team at Equadriana, so we get all the feedback and then at the end we take decisions and the feedback was, well, powerful floral is, you know, interesting, but 
at Toa, you know, with, with such a beautiful harvest year, we look for complexity. So we conched a bit and you know, sacrificed a bit of the flower power, but got a bit more, more of the other aromas in. Okay. Well, I went ahead and opened up the box. And um, I have to say that you know, these are premium priced chocolates. Um, some of them are among the most expensive chocolates in the world. Um, and the packaging very definitely fits the notion of a, a luxury brand. I mean, it is high quality paper, nice printing. Um, and, you know, when you take apart a box with just a sing single bar in it or the larger bars in it, I mean, there's an inner wrap in it and then there's a wrap inside of that. And so it is very, very complex. And you, you get the sense that somebody has really thought through all of the packaging on those. And I noticed we do have um, tasting notes for the um, for the um, the 18 mini bars. Uh, I want to start off with the 2014, uh, the rain harvest, uh, but I have to go digging in the box because it's not on the top layer. So I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> we I'm recently. Gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go spill the box in order to be able. We to recently changed it. that actually. <laughs> What's that? You put the older we ones recently, on the top. Yeah, like put the, uh, you know, the first ones on the label list on the top and then the other ones on the bottom. Okay. So um, well, guide me through and, it. I'm ignoring the tasting notes. So guide me through it. Do either of you have the chocolate in front of you? Or um, no. Am I, am I the only one tasting here? You're the only one. Okay. Great. I, I so, wish I had it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not, not being in the office. I, I can't just... Right. So is it available for sale in Australia, James? Um, not in retail stores, but we do have customers that order online. Okay. Yeah, All right. and we ship. All right. So what, what should I know? I mean, it has a nice, it has a nice snap, right? I, you know, I very, very carefully washed my hands over an hour ago so that anything, the aroma, it's the, the aroma seems complex. Nothing jumps out at me. And it's not, it's not really, uh, it's not really assertive. Um, is that surprising? Is that what I should expect on the aroma of this one? I think, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty much. Like with 2014, what happens with the chocolate over time is a bit um, with our chocolate, right? That's what we have the experience with. Is that with 2014, kind of all the peaks were cut off, so nothing kind of really jumps out, which. Um, Jerry, who, who loves uh, to dig into the analogy with wine, um, that's what usually happens also to, for example, Pinot Noir when you age it. Um, so it kind of, usually it's, it's more difficult to identify like very specific things that pop out, but mm -hmm. with a bit of patience and attention, um, you can still find many of the, of the aromas that are just kind of more on the same level. Yeah, I think if you think about, like, you can think about primary flavors and secondary or tertiary flavors, like the primary flavors have sort of mellowed a lot, like Carl suggested, and that makes it in some ways harder to pick like a dominant flavor or aroma, but it makes it perhaps easier to access those more subtle ones because they're not being sort of, um, you know, blown away by a really, I don't know, acidic flavor or, um, you know, chocolate So were these, were these tasting notes written in 2014? No, the, the ones you're looking at uh, have been written, like, recently. Because they, what we realized, they change a lot. That's what happened with our 100% edition, for example. Um, we never thought we would ever like release it as a liquor, to be honest. It was a batch um, that, you know, just we, we put a bit of liquor aside and then we didn't know what to do with it yet, um, but we wanted to experiment. And then um, at some point, James said, hey, why don't we have 100% in our portfolio? And there was a, you know, one, one spot to fill for a new product launch. So I said, okay, let's pull out our little reserves of liquor. And we tested a few, we went, you know, so excited. Um, and then the the most unlikely liquor was pulled out from 2016. It was a 
difficult year and it was um, relatively stringent, more than you know we would like it to be, especially for being a liquor. And then suddenly it was really pleasant. It completely changed. Like we checked our tasting notes and that was a different chocolate. Um, so yeah, that's regarding your question. We did the tasting again to okay. definitely evolve. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, the reason why I asked is, um, you know, there is the power of suggestion. If you read the tasting notes and you go, oh, there's supposed to be green tea in here, which is one of the suggested notes, you go, okay, there's a flavor in there I wouldn't normally associate necessarily with green tea. But now that I know that that's yeah. what it is, I go, okay, that's what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So I noticed that in the 2015 you have the difference between the light and the dark. Are those the roasts? Because I'm thinking of the 2014 mm -hmm. as a fairly heavily roasted. I mean, there is a, there is a sort of dominant roast that comes through. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know about flavor, so for example, when you conch, one of the things you do is when you get rid of acetic acid, which is left over from fermentation and drying, what that, that the acetic acid going away reveals um, aromas that are hidden by the acid. And so as the balance changes over time, flavors, aromas that might have been hidden previously and wouldn't be a dominant part of the flavor profile, all of a sudden become dominant parts of the flavor profile because mm. something else is no longer... Or at least perceivable. At least perceivable, right. or, I think. That's true. Yeah. Mm. That's probably a better way to go. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, um, yeah, so... 2015 light and dark, the difference is within the same harvest season, just to be, you know, down to the very specific details. Uh, within the same harvest season, between February to May, we divided them into um, two parts, like February, March, and then April, May. And then I think the most important difference is um, fermentation. So they received a different fermentation time and the same roast like we applied the same roast to both um, and then the only other thing um, we wanted to create a like a sweeter chocolate so obviously you know light has more sugar um, and the dark has just less sugar it's a darker chocolate um, but we decided that a bit based on its profile because light was not just it's not just light because of its sugar it's also the profile from the fermentation mostly is kind of the on the you know honey subtle um caramel side and dark is just a bit, bit more earthy woody so mm -hmm. yeah then we kind of underlined that through the sugar amount mm -hmm. well it has a very very different mouthfeel it melts uh, much more quickly it's much much softer the uh, the crack is much uh, uh, is the snap is mm -hmm. much less firm. Um, these are all you know well tempered, so I don't think the snap has anything to do with the temper. Um, but um, so it may be the cocoa butter content. I mean, these are exactly the same origin and genetics of beans, just fermented yeah. slightly differently with different amounts of sugar. Yeah, and we don't add in those additional cacao butter. The only addition where we did that was Galapagos just because the cacao had such a low amount. I think it was 41% if I'm, oh, I remember wow. correctly. So it was so low that there was no way we could make the chocolate into a bar. Um, so we extracted the cacao butter from the same beans and just added them back into the chocolate. But all the other additions don't have additional cacao butter. Okay, right. Really, really interesting. So I'm trying the dark now. Mm -hmm. Being careful not to spill any crumb that might follow because of that. What was interesting about the um, the light part, the light, the 2015, is um, a really, really um, interesting note of sort of like you had licked the inside of a wine barrel at the end. So there's this interesting, because wood... Um, is in the tasting notes, but it came through as a sort of astringency, not, not necessarily a flavor of wood, but a sensation of wood, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so, you know, as you get astringency sometimes in like the red, red wine, 
Yeah. They wouldn't think so. Mm -hmm. oh, I've quite often heard people ask if the harvest chocolates uh, have been aged at all in barrels or with or with liquor, mm -hmm. which you know they haven't at all. But mm. yeah, there may be some connection there with what you're experiencing. Right. Well, the, the, the fact that this is an 80%, 80 plus, I mean, it says it's 80 and a half percent. I mean, there is um, this nice, strong um, flavor of chocolate on the back end of this. I mean, it just, after everything starts off, it just, chocolate is in your mouth, it just sort of explodes, and then it goes away. I mean, all of these, um, the melt and the finish of them, I mean, the, there's no cloying aspect to the fat associated with them, you know, and that's, you know, you know, you know, attributable to good handling all the way from the tree into the manufacturing. And sometimes when you do add cocoa butter, if the two different cocoa butters don't have the same melting point, right, mm -hmm. you have two different fats mm -hmm. that melt differently in the mouth at the same time. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can contribute to, among other things, the waxy texture that people say. But it also mm -hmm. complicates the melt. And so it doesn't clean out of your mouth quite as easily as some mm -hmm. other things do. So this El Nino harvest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that one had a, pretty, had a pretty rough year. And um, you also feel a little bit of particle size. We, I don't know if, you know if everyone is going to pick that up, but we tried to do a little bit of an arti artistic move of, you know, a rough year gets a bit of a rougher texture. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of a rougher ride um, when it comes to aroma. It's pretty dark, you know. You, you see it on the flavor profile we, we, we added. It's earthy. It has a sweetness to it um, with this, you know, ripe banana twist. Um, Often we have lots of discussions of how to describe what everyone perceives and find a consensus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just decide to put it in a creative way so that people can see if they can, can asso associate it with it. With it. Um, I remember sometimes we put something like um, wine cellar, for example, just because there's this earthiness in it. Um, mm -hmm. I get the... Uh... Like for me, I, I always remember with El Nino, the sensation of like the, there's this kind of damp or like dank is not the right word, but like this humid dampness kind of thing. You don't but, want you you don't want dank but, on tasting notes. No, yeah. but you know like that kind of, or or like even the what's the word for like I guess when you have where mushrooms grow in the in the forest floor type of thing. But it's almost a bit like if you go for a walk in the forest. It's been raining in the morning. And then the sun comes out, you go for the walk, and it's kind of like the sun beating down on the on the vegetation, the damp vegetation kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's how it reminds me a little bit. But And also it's like it's associated with the, the – well, yeah, like Carl said, it was a particularly difficult year. It was something like um, – I think it was about four times the average rainfall at the beginning of the harvest. Um, wow. So a lot of the – the fruit, you know, the flowers um, didn't make it into fruit. Um, and then Ecuador had its largest earthquake in 90 years, um, sort of around the time of harvest. Um, so people were distracted and, and, and couldn't, you know, tend to their trees. And so when people did have the opportunity to go and harvest, it was a late harvest relative to the usual. Um, and the drought had already set in. And so, you, you know, had lost even more fruit through that process um and i think it gave like this intensity to the the fruit that did survive um you know the cacao tree had yeah, I, I, put a lot of energy like, into those ones. I personally like the connection between just the huge amount of humidity um that year and then a little bit of that is somehow reflected in the chocolate itself mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a complexity in the flavor profile of this one. It it starts off with a little bit of this earthy note that you're talking about, and mm -hmm. rather than you know all the flavors sort of being on top of each other at once as they might have been in in the 2014 rain harvest, what happens is there's definitely a progression of flavor notes. Um, 
one of the things that struck me about this one compared with the other ones is that there's bright aromatics. You know, what's happening in this chocolate happens uh, on the above the tongue. Yeah, there is something above bright. the tongue and yeah. in the nose. Mm -hmm. And so when you say mint, we think of mint as bright and aromatic, right? And mm -hmm. so this, this, you know, it's really as you go. Right, and it's all up here, and, and it's very, very different from the 2015 dark because of the chocolateiness that happens at the side mm. of the mouth, at the tongue, and, and below and underneath. It's really quite remarkable. And then all of this stuff happens, and this little bit of banana comes through at the very end. I mean, it, again, um, you know, you're aware that it's supposed to be there because of the tasting notes, but it is very definitely present, um, but not overwhelming. Mm. It's really, really interesting combination of I think what we yeah one of the things I guess that you're getting at is is something that's really interesting for us or and, and often for customers is that you know cacao coming from the very same trees each year can offer such a wide range or even no, it, it obviously falls within like for us the national profile but even within a, a singular profile you can sort of hit on different um, elements of that um, profile and have complexity from year to year. Um, well, well it's, it's what we expect in wine. If I have, you know, yeah, the same exactly. vineyard producing exactly the mm -hmm. same grapes one yeah. year compared with the next, depending upon exactly. how much rain, when it falls, how much sun, yeah. all this other kind of stuff. Um, it has different sugar at different chemical levels and mm -hmm. the juice is remarkably different. And so yeah. it shouldn't be surprising yeah. The same thing is true in cocoa, which is chemically more complex, arguably, yeah. than, than mm -hmm. grace is. It's just that industrial chocolate, which is what we've all grown up with, right? Uh, the hallmark is repeatability. In industrial chocolate, you want the chocolate. That's right. They spend a lot of money year. working out how to make right. it taste right. the same. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and, Someone you know, from Mars said, uh, said to us, we have so many research about, you know, complex, whatever, like mm -hmm. exotic uh, uh, origins, whatever. But we spend almost all our money on, on achieving a consistent flavor profile and try to bend nature to provide us the, the same flavor profile over and over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's one of the, it's one of the ironies. Mm. is that um, with big chocolate makers, the art, right, if you want, is the art is how do mm. we take this percentage of this bean and that percentage of that bean and roast them yeah. in this particular way, get them yeah. as close as we possibly can, then put vanilla on the top to hide all the differences yeah. between them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, and that, you know, the same thing is true. We have jug wine, and the jug wine is, you know, the reason why a lot of people like it is when they buy you know, it's not mm. vintage. It's not vintage. There are no differences. Mm. You know, yeah, they know what they're going to get. They know what they're going to get. And the science of winemaking is so much better understood and so much, the knowledge is mm. so, so much more widely distributed. Yeah. You know, I often wonder what would have happened if cacao trees grew in the Loire Valley, right? What would, what would chocolate be like if that were the case? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be, you know, very, very different. Um, you know, the rain, the rain, the 2017 rain harvest, um, um, pistachio and orange bitters. Oh, I'm a big fan of, well, grapefruit bitters, Campari, for example, mm -hmm. and that whole range of Amari out of Italy and, and things like that. Um, so I get the, the edge, which comes from the botanical load that you find in a bitters. All right, and I think this is a really, really apt description. There is some floral. I mean, I think of, when I think of Nacional, I think of jasmine and orange blossom. I mean, it's the dominant you know, when you're looking at it, dominant. And this is really, I think, one of the first ones that's really, really demonstrated some of that flavor profile for me. But I like the complexity of the bitters aspect of it, you know, this botanical load. Uh, maybe, you know, it, it's, it's, it's coming from, you know, what you describe as cherries. I think they're sort of munged together for me, difficult to pull out of them. And then pistachio. I mean, one of my favorite nuts in confectionery is pistachio. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving, I'm loving the combination here. Um, so this is a real treat. I mean, 
as I had, you know, as, as, as I explained uh, to James, uh, we were in Amsterdam at Chocoa in February and we, you know, ran across each other, you know, every day saying, yeah, we got to sit down. We, we got to sit down and have a taste <laughs> and have a taste. And we never had the opportunity to do so. And in all of the outreach that had been done since 2014, you know, this is the first time a box of Toax chocolate has ever come my way. You know, I've had to go and you know, I've, 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 I've had to, well, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, we're in the middle of our first snowstorm here in New York. We're in the middle of being locked down for other reasons, and so this is really, really quite a treat in, in terms of um, starting off um, what's going on. And then finally, in this box, the 2018. The 2018 rain harvest. The 2018 rain harvest. What I really I'm going to say about all of these things um, is that each of them has a distinct identity. Right? Same beans coming from the same place, right? fermented probably very differently from year to year to year, probably not using the same fermentation profile. Um, I'm guessing from what you've said in terms of experimenting. Yeah, mm -hmm. most of yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Um, different roasting. Wow. I mean, there's this really interesting fruit acidity that's happening on this last one, which has been completely missing. You call it cranberry. I'm not necessarily getting the cranberry flavor, but I'm getting the kind of tartness that I associate with cranberries mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Really, really quite remarkable. Um, um, fudge, almost a baked brownie note, which is, mm -hmm. I think, when people think about chocolate, one of their favorite flavors in chocolate. Um, the average, the average consumer is this baked brownie note. If, if it tastes like baked brownies, it's like yum, 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 yum. And mm -hmm. there's a little bit of herbaceousness in there. I mean, it's, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, you know, at home, if anybody has got two really good friends <laughs> and what you want to do is have a, uh, an interesting tasting session with two really good friends. Um, That's right. That's then um, you don't, don't need more through. than three. I'm sorry? Yeah, you don't want more than three people you're getting well, it. Well, <laughs> these are three gram pieces. And so trying to break in half a three gram piece means individual tastes are um, yeah. um, become a little bit tiny. But again, I think what's remarkable here, um, again, is the fact that every single one of them has this really, really individual identity. Um, and it's quite distinct and really quite remarkable. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of places... Uh, in the world where, um, you know, I, I don't think that this, this kind of experimentation, um, well, maybe the experimentation is going on, but it doesn't actually make it into chocolate, which gets into um, the hands of people. Um, I'm sort of, let's go quickly um, into the next tasting box because, you know, we've, 45 minutes have gone right now. So it's been, it's been fun so far. So I have the, um, the um, harvest and age box. Mm -hmm. and so we have a number of different harvests um, and we have a number of different things that have been put in with the harvest. And what I want to focus on here, because I do not want to blow my palate out with everything, with the Kempi pepper, if I had that, I think, I don't know that I would be able to taste anything afterwards when I got done, is when were your first experiments with cask aging? And you age with beans, you age with nibs. Can you tell us how you go do that? Um, sure. sure. Okay. We we started in 2014. Um, I think the the whole idea about aging came because Jerry had Jerry has a you know passion and is knowledgeable about uh, liquors and wine, and the analogy with wine was always present for us from the very beginning. That's where also the harvest uh, years come from. And then I think the, the final decision, I believe, was made when Jerry had a conversation with someone from Wine Spectator. And they talked about the, the pairing. Um, and I, it's, it's a bit blurry, but I remember that we then started to pair it with uh, different spirits just a few, and, and the one that stood out immediately was cognac. So that that discussion about cognac and how well it goes with 2014 
um, was a topic. And then this guy from Wine Spectator, I unfortunately I forgot his name. He put us in touch with uh, a private producer in France and this person sold us a cask, which we brought to Ecuador as soon as possible. We put in the 2014 chocolate, you know, and I can't go now with, with such a, a little time at hand into all the details about how nervous we were. Um, we decided at the end, I think, to put in, I believe it was 40 kilos, which, you know, is quite a bit. It's risky. We didn't know if it's going to work out. Um, but, um, yeah, after... Yeah, you know, obviously after a week we started to taste and uh, it started to taste pretty nice. And then after 18 months, we decided to to release our, our first edition. At the same time, since, you know, we, we, we noted that the chocolate picks up the flavor, um, we retempered the bar or the chocolate into a bar and, and realized that the flavor is going to stick to the chocolate. Very quickly, we started to basically build these little... Uh, boxes here out of Ecuadorian wood types um, and filled them with chocolate as well. Like the same idea like with those casks um, that you see over there. There's Denise, by the way. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how it started. And um, at the beginning, we I remember the first cask we filled with, uh, or, or boxes we filled, the vessels, we filled with 20 kilo blocks, which we, you know, just made 20 kilo blocks. That's why they have that size actually. But very soon after we changed our approach because we were chatting with people from uh, the Washington um, University and their wine, wine and research center. And the discussion was around, you know, what, what can we learn from wine aging and apply to chocolate? So we sent them samples, but they said it's gonna take probably decades to have solid uh, scientific information, so we weren't as patient. Um, so the well, the, the the point is that they the most important information I think that we we very quickly um, came across was we need to ex maximize the uh, exposure to oxygen. So a twenty kilo block is not a good idea. So we turned the chocolate into little coins of one gram, two grams max, and that's how we age our chocolate until today. Well, I was involved with an experiment in the last six months with a with a uh, with, with a maker, and it, you know the original chocolate that got made after it was exposed. So they um, they were um, aromatizing the beans or nibs, right, and then converting that into chocolate. And the thing that came out of the the machine. All right. Immediately after it was inc apparently incredibly aromatic and complex and had notes that were not in the original, in the original spirit at all. But unfortunately, it, it pretty much all disappeared within a week. That oh, that okay. that magical characteristic mm, that came okay. with the chocolate. So how do you how do you? I mean, you so the spirits that you're using. What you're noticing is that um, they are. Last the 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 um, the effect the the aromatizing all right is lasting uh, quite a bit longer than I mean they're persisting how, that, how does how does it age so you have an aged chocolate you have an aged spirit you put the two of them together and then they age together and what is that well the, the the yeah the cask is empty when we get it unfortunately we are not importing full casks that we have to then empty ourselves and deal with somehow. Um, and so the, the wood is impregnated with the aroma of the spirit. And then I think like to Carl's point about maximizing the oxygenation that, um, you know, cause we have more surface area with the coins. The other, I think a noteworthy difference with nibs or beans is that the chocolate, you know, in the format of chocolate, it's much more porous. You've broken it down to a micron level. Um, and and it's the cacao butter that's uh, absorbing the aroma. So if you're trying to capture that mm -hmm. with like a bean or a nib, you're probably just coating the bean or the nib um, with some sort of aroma. And then you know perhaps in the in the grinding or the conching, you know that that disappears. But we're you know we're capturing it. I think it's being 
like it's creating a union at a much smaller level. Um, and then it's right. a, a, usually a longer process for us as well. Like we're talking about chocolate's been aged three, four, five years. And so it's really bonding, you know, at a mm. molecular level. Mm, there are two things that we could share from our experience so far. Like one is with our cognac cask. We would have liked to age our chocolate for like, you know, 10, 20 years. Everyone was ambitious and had the dream, but Unfortunately, after six years, um, the flavor started to drop. And we believe it's because the air in Quito is really dry. And we have to be more careful with our casks because the wood, um, how would you say, compresses. So it opens up. And so, so air starts to, mm. it starts to circulate. And we believe that's the reason why maybe we weren't able to age the chocolate longer in the cognac cask. So that's one thing um, where we clearly like cognac cask uh, didn't pass the test for the bars anymore after six years. You and don't you don't the, you don't have a you don't have a cob that's underground. You know, that's just in the caves where you can put you know perfectly temperature. Not yet. Yeah. Not maybe yet, the no. next maybe the next genera generation of family <laughs> owners will uh, build that. <laughs> And then the other, the other um, part that's more obvious where we realize that we lose flavor intensity is when, you know, when we temper the chocolate and, and then you just, you know, for example, then some mistake happens at, at tempering and you put the chocolate back, you temper it again. And maybe you do that like five times for whatever reason. Um, those bars have been exposed to too much, much oxygen. Um, that's like the conclusion because flavor would just um, be much weaker than it was before starting the tempering process. Mm -hmm. I, I would suggest, Clay, like one idea is you could take, um, start with the Isla whiskey cask, but actually before tasting that, go back to the 2015 light because it's exactly the same chocolate. And then you can do like a before and after. Thank um, you very much for pointing that out. I'm not going to have an opportunity to do that now, but what I will do that is afterwards. And in my notes, I will let, I will, I will make yeah. that. The 2015 right. light and the Isla are. Yeah. Yes. And then the other, Chocolate. yeah. The other two age that you have in that box are the same as the 2015 dark. So okay. usually the, the easiest way is to look at the percentages. That'll tell you which chocolate it started out as. Mm. Um, Very, very cool. Account. Very, very cool. Good to know. Thank you very much. I will definitely look forward to making to making those. So I have now in my hands um, the Galapagos. So mm. people think of Ecuador and they think of you know Los Rios and Manabí and Esmeraldas and um, the area around um, uh, Guayaquil, right? So not on Hall and places like that as origins for cocoa beans. How long has cocoa been growing on the islands? I mean, is it about been there forever? And, you know, I'm sorry? No, about it was, it was bought, yeah, about 80 years. It was bought there by, they're not the early settlers, but, you know, more recent settlers. Back when the biosecurity wasn't so strong. So 80, years, could, 80 years ago? So yeah. in, the in the 1940s. Okay. Mm-hmm. People Because when we think of the, the golden age of cocoa in Ecuador, uh, the Pepe de Oro, uh, the golden seed, we're thinking of the 1880s. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my remember from, from, from my visits there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, also the, um, the colleagues and friends who grow uh, the cacao in Galapagos, they did a DNA test with HCP, if I remember correctly. I, I don't know. I believe it was with HCP. And the result reflected pretty much the same hybrid profile from what you find currently in Ecuador. Uh, so in theory, you know, if it would have been earlier, I was curious, you know, maybe it's pure nacional, we don't know, but it was just a hybrid. Right. Which is well, if, it got trans if it got transplanted in the islands in the 1940s, this is after the blight that devastated production. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the, you know, it, it makes sense that it that you know a very very scarce genetic type might not have made it. Um, mm. They would have taken something. But how much production is there in the Galapagos? I mean, I can't imagine it's very much. 
No, it's very, very little. Yes, I mean, you, there's no data about it, or official data at least, but it's really little. Like, um, and it comes and goes as well. You know, our our friend um, uh, Patricia, who is growing cacao, she started a few years ago, and she said that you know people who have been growing cacao moved over to coffee because that's a very prosperous business at the moment in Galapagos um, and then we try to uh, see if we can encourage people to move towards cacao instead of less sustainable um, crops on Galapagos. Yep. Well this is also a full-size bar. All the other ones have been small tasting squares so we're now into a full-size bar here. And so it, I don't know how much of the difference in texture in terms of bite and chew is because of the fact that I have a, a, a piece that's about twice as thick as everything else that I've had here. It's a com completely different chocolate to all of our other chocolates. So. Well, mm. No, but, but the, yeah. the texture in the mouth. The, yeah, yeah, on every, there's soft, on every level. Rich, there's a soft richness here. I mean, it's mm. got a, it's got a, like a firm fudgy. bite, but when you bite into it, it's like... Um, going through a really really good um smooth praline almost mm -hmm. right? this guy when it, you know not when you bite through it but as it melts i mean as it's it a melts very, yeah very it's a good analogy very different texture and um we added five percent cacao butter as i mentioned that might be one reason and then we also had difficulties with tampering in this chocolate and at the end the tampering curve we decided I think was really on the edge of what's possible and we then tested the texture and everyone liked it it was like it tastes like fudge it has the texture of fudge let's keep it like that mm -hmm. no it definitely has this it definitely has this um, fudge like um, character um, um, and I, I, you know, the thing that I would, the thing that I would say is, is if there's one chocolate that I've tasted so far, th I would say that this is maybe the most accessible to somebody. It's such a really good bridge. If you're interested in an Ecuadorian chocolate, that's not like other Ecuadorian chocolates that you've had. And mm. part of that is th this origin, but it mm. just is a really, really different, really, really different approach. Um, yeah. To everything. I mean, you know it immediately when you break the bar, right? Mm. right? And it's going to be a very different chocolate. The way the way it separates on the mold lines is just, mm. you know, it just falls apart almost. Um, and mm -hmm. it's really quite remarkable. And you know, it's not too warm where it is. No, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's so it's cool. really, really, really lovely. And there is this nice fudgy characteristic, and that the fudgy texture right, echoes the fudgy flavor. It's 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 really quite. Um, uh, really quite um, well. It lacks some of the complexity that many of the other chocolates have, um, but there's a, a sort of satisfactoriness, satisfaction component. You put it out, <laughs> yeah. it's like, oh, this mm -hmm. is old home week. You know, yeah. like, oh, it's this probably is a good. Week. You know, it's a good month to enjoy it because we kind of talked a little bit about Christmas-like flavors in there, like the mm -hmm. spices and the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I haven't answered your question regarding the decision on sugar. So in this case, um, it's, it's a good example. We, the, the lab tests we did were with 5% less sugar, actually. And everyone loved them. But then at the same time, for you know the, the average, let's say, TOAG team palette, we said, well, it's a bit too sweet. Like we would like to have a bit more strength from the cacao bean in there. And then we went up by 5% and we, you know, we thought that's nice. Um, so you definitely get a bit of the, you know, the bitterness of the bean as well, but um, that's just our style, I, I guess. Well, I, I, what I would say is that the bitterness um, <clears throat> is balanced. I mean, the bitterness is not from bad fermentation, which sometimes bitterness is. The bitterness is not from over roasting, you know, so, but there's, so the bitterness doesn't call attention to itself, but what it does is it adds some richness structure. and complexity mm. structure. Yeah, that's mm. a that's a very good way to to think about the, the the bitterness component of this. I mean, 
yeah, I, I appreciate many of the others, the El Nino harvest because of complexity and just, mm. you know, just how bright and aromatic it is. But this one, you know, is like, you know, although I might not give this to a five-year-old, right, because they're not going to be able to appreciate what they won't, they won't care where, where it came from. But it is definitely, I mean, this is a high coke. I mean, this is, you know, kid grows up on milk chocolate. Hey, try this one. Yeah, the, no. the, the no, Galapagos. No. I mean, it's definitely, they're going to go and it's going to like a big, big smile on their face for where they do. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, yeah. it's a lovely thing. Um, and we have one more, which is the 2016 El Nino. Um, That's the 100% before, that Carl. This is, this is the 100%. Mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same chocolate. Well, same. Same beans. Liquor, the El Nino. Okay. Same liquor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same Almost. Batch. I don't know if that's the right expression, but we almost discovered it by accident. We didn't expect to have um, that as 100% in our portfolio. It, it earned its place over time. You didn't expect any 100% or you didn't expect this 100%? Well, we wanted a 100%, but we weren't really sure, I think, until James put it on the table and said, look, you know, 100% bars are pretty popular. There might be people amongst our, our customers that would appreciate a 100% bar from Torg. And we were like, well, that was when we decided not to launch Cast. So we were like, okay, how are we going to fill that gap? And then the 100% bar made sense. Um, yeah, then, it, then it, everyone was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's, let's see if we have something we can launch. Um, and then we just kept trying and trying. And there was, with none of, of the 100% options, there was this moment of, yeah, this is the one. It was like, yeah, okay, maybe. Let's try the next one. But then when El Nino came along, we were like, oh, that's interesting. Like, mm -hmm. that could be it. And it was a big surprise. And it was kind of, it was like, I think the last yeah. one that Carl pulled out because we didn't expect it to be, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a, contender, a contender because it was, yeah. I guess it was complex enough as a 78% and, you know, perhaps challenging for some people's palate as a 78% uh, chocolate, let alone a 100%. But, yeah, the, the aging over three, four years had really mellowed some of the, you know. I can certainly, I can certainly see how it has, it has mellowed. I mean, it's there. It, it's interesting. I mean, the texture is almost French in some respects. So, you know, if I think about, you know, Bonat, right, when you try um, any of his bars, um, there is a lot of added cocoa butter, right, and you get this sort of unctuous richness quality to everything that they make, and it doesn't matter what they do. And everything is either a 65% for the milk or 75% for the dark, right? So mm -hmm. um, you really are focusing on how much sugar, Right. There is. And it's all the same. And so the approach to roasting is the same and percentages give you a particular um, kind of look. Is that feedback from you guys or from me? Mm. That's right. It disappeared. So we're not going to worry about it. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, um, and um, it has a texture in this chocolate that I would associate as being French. I mean, there's no added cocoa butter, but it has this really, really unctuous mouthfeel. And what's interesting about it for 100% is what comes through in the, um, the other El Nino harvest is this bright aromatic at the top of the, top of the nose, right? So at the top of the mouth and in the nose, that aspect is here. I mean, it seems almost sweet in some respects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It seems almost sweet and this bright right. aromatic stuff is going on and it, you know, it is does not eat like a one hundred percent chocolate. I think that's what got everyone so excited was that you, you, you know, you would normally think, okay, one hundred percent. If if you don't like one hundred percent normally, then you have to kind of fight back some of the bitterness or astringency and you know get through it. But on 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 this chocolate, you can actually enjoy some of the fruity notes and the floral and the bright notes um, without. Sort of cringing, you know, they're just they're just there and they're not overwhelmed. Well, there's nothing in a 100%. There's nothing to hide behind. 
Yeah. You know, you, you know okay. if you, you do not have perfect beans and you do not ferment them properly and you do not roast them well, I mean, there, sugar isn't yeah. going to hide it. You know, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing you can do to hide that. Um, yeah. And what's astonishing for me is that combination of softness, no added cocoa butter. Mm. The combination of the softness of this with the brightness of it, it's just not what I'm expecting when I put mm. 100%, 100% chocolate in my mouth. So it's really quite remarkable mm. in that respect. Um, so this has been, this has been, this has been a treat. Um, what, what is next on the horizon for new experimentation, <laughs> right? Anything that you can share that we should be able to expect? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we've got some big, for TOAC anyway, in our little universe, we've got some big plans. Um, we're, we're still in the thick of it, in the middle of it, but we're, um, working on, uh, well, the name of it at the moment, it, it may yet change, but it's the TOAC flavors collection and so um we're looking at um and it'd be interesting to get your your sort of thoughts on this because it's still you know a little bit um flexible but we basically we wanted to well we need we want to grow what we're doing uh in a number of ways we want to increase the impact we have um at the farm level because we pay you know great prices um we care a lot about um you know, regenerative agriculture and sustainability at the, at the farm level. But, you know, with the current model that we have, we have very limited production. Um, it's also from a business standpoint, you know, being able to grow a little bit will help us um, in, a lot, in a lot of areas, um, you know. Uh, and so we felt that the best way to do that would be to work on a range of inclusion bars um, and to do it in a very authentic way in a way that also permits us the storytelling that we enjoy doing. Um, we plan to use um, flavors that are derived from traditional Ecuadorian uh, desserts, mostly. Um, uh, in some cases, um, condiments, uh, if you like, in Ecuador. Um, and um, yeah, so they're, um, they're probably flavors that are quite relatable, but they're done in a very Ecuadorian way. Um, and then we, um, so, so that's probably the, the big um, difference. It will be our first range of actual inclusion bars because the aged chocolate introduces a, a complementary flavor uh, profile to the chocolate, um, but it's very subtle and integrated. This, this will be much more the typical sort of um, you know, what do you expect from inclusion bars? But, um, um, one way to make the products more accessible um, is to actually make the packaging far less complex. Yes, yeah. And I exactly. think that the notion of introducing a range of chocolates, uh, which, in, which um, are inclusion bars, is a way of, of really, really easily segmenting yeah, very yeah. different product lines, which might have- Avoiding cannibalization. Well, they would have, mm -hmm. they, but you could also have very possible. different price points. Yeah, right? because mm -hmm. in general, inclusions are going to be less expensive than chocolate. Yeah, it's not the purest approach. It's uh, it's yeah, it's like a fun, more of a fun, uh, you know. Well, but if, play if, on, if, on but if you actually think about it, I mean, this is one thing that sure. Spencer Hyman and I talk a lot about it when we're at Chocoa, is mm. how do you get people who are interested in a Hershey milk chocolate bar with almonds mm. interested mm -hmm. in or like something which is much more complicated in terms mm -hmm. of um, both chocolate um, and inclusion. And the way you do that is by creating a bridge bar. You have something in yeah. between, right? Yeah. And so this becomes a really, really interesting way to go about doing that. And by lowering the cost, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And um, um, you also make it more accessible. They like, go, oh, this is something I can do. And they, they can see um, their trajectory. Mm -hmm. And once they've done that, they can go, ooh, I, I can see... And so I can see one of the things that might, yeah. that might be done is if you like this one, try one of these as the mm, next step mm -hmm. up in yeah, the category the is going. Yeah. Um, and when yeah. I was in Ecuador last, it's been far too long since I was in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. My first ever trip to origin oh, was cool. in Ecuador. I went to Yachana. All right. So up the Rio Napo from Coca. Mm -hmm. So it was quite wow. a journey and, and quite an immersion in a very short period of time. Mm. Um, 
one of the things I noticed was um, there's not a whole lot of iconography in Ecuadorian arche um, archaeological records that suggests that Ecuadorians used cocoa or ha held cocoa in the same reverence that would have been true in um, Mayan Mesoamerica. There's just, there is no iconography. You'll, you'll find old things with, you know, corn on them, but you won't find cocoa in them. Uh, and so one of the things that, you know, I'm really intrigued about with inclusions is, is how you approach them because you know, everybody is using aguamanto or golden berries. You know, everybody has got mm -hmm. this and that and the other. Uh, but there seem to be a fairly narrow range of things uh -huh. that are being used. And I guess what we, like, just one thing that comes to mind is what we ended up not wanting to do. And, you know, we love all of our other friends in the chocolate industry in Ecuador and try to work as collaboratively as possible. But we didn't want to just bring something out that would kind of be another version of what they're doing. So if you think about the Takaris or Republica del Cacao, etc., they, you know, they have some great inclusion bars um, and they tend to get, I guess, like um, interesting singular ingredients and add them, uh, you know, like whether it's, I guess, you know, the pink salt from Peru, I think it's pink or maybe it's not pink, but anyway, the salt from Peru or, mm. or the golden berries or the, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so we've tried to, I guess, take our own approach and like a, Mentioned, you know, we, well, we, we do, we do, Carl can talk about the iconography because he spent a lot of time studying that, but we do, you know, really try and draw out the connection, um, the cultural connection, um, if you like, between cacao and Ecuador and the history and, and, and that in, in everything we do and in, in the packaging, there's little elements of that that are not immediately obvious to everyone. Um, but by, t by taking, you know, traditional recipes in Ecuador and, and, you know, formulating them for a chocolate bar, we're able to do some of that. Um, we're not going to find a Kui Kui bar though, right? <laughs> I think so. No, no, a Kui no. bar, that would be... Uh, so far yeah. we, have, we have discussed the flavor range um, derived from the recipes are um, like we have peanuts, we have sea salt, we have um, coconut, we have guayaba, we have ca like caramel, panela kind of flavors. Um, so it's nothing like strange, but the combination sometimes is, is just the interesting part. For example, um, sal prieta is one of the, one of the top um, options at the moment. And that's peanut, uh, sea salt, and different Ecuadorian herbs. That's the combination of it. Um, here, you you know, th they serve it on a plate. It's ground, and then you dip your sweet or just green cooked banana into it and put it in your mouth. That's it. So it's you know, it's something I really love since I discovered it for myself. And um, we thought, you know, look at the the ingredients that should probably go well with chocolate mm -hmm. and um, so far we like the experiment mm. well i'm i'm really looking forward i'm really looking forward to uh, tasting these new mm. uh, these new additions to the line seeing the way they're packaged now um, all the products um, are available um, in the united states these were, were sent to me from a priori um, mm -hmm. are these orderable at retail through a priori or mm -hmm. how or online through who right if i yeah we a box of each or something mm -hmm. we have i mean the easiest way is our website toakchocolate.com um but most of the range is available through caputos.com <laughs> they do our fulfillment in the u.s you know because we we don't have the physical presence in the u.s it's hard for us to do the logistical side of things, um, especially given it's our biggest market. So Caputo's and a priori are a great partner in that sense. Um, but then, yeah, you can find our chocolate in some of the, the retail stores that they um, supply to as well. Not all of them. We're, we're expecting with the new flavors range that will um, expand our footprint. Um, cool. Now, just to set expectations, this Galapagos bar, 
right? Which may not last the weekend. <laughs> the other ones are definitely that's, ones. That's I'm the aim. The, well, the other ones are definitely. I mean, right? I have you know housemates, and I'm going to need to share and, and things like that. But I decided to keep that one for for my own. Um, what you know, you know, I think of many of these other specialty bars is you know running in the thirty five to forty five dollars per range. Where does the Galapagos bar fit into that that realm? I think you hit the hammer on the head of the nail or whatever you say the expression is when you you know you said that it's a great like introductory bar and so that is our introduction introductory bar it's 25 dollars um a bar and then all of the harvest bars that you tried are 35 dollars um and then once we start getting into the aged bars like the um aged with compote pepper or palo santo wood those are 40 dollars um, and then once you get into the cask age, that's 50 and $55 a bar. Um, and then the mini bar selection. So the harvest one is $55 and you're trying six different, um, editions there. And the harvest and aged is $65, 55 and 65. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to one thing that was said early on. Um, in this. And we, Carl, I think you mentioned um, paying attention. And so one of the things which I think is um, really, really important for people to take away from this is that there are chocolates that when you pay attention to them, they don't return anything, right? Or they don't return much. You pay attention to them and they're mm -hmm. not really worthy of the attention that you pay to them. And I think that every single one of the chocolates that I tasted today is not only deserving of attention, but rewards attention uh, in very, very different ways. So, you know, I would definitely recommend um, the little mini bar selections in order to be able to, you know, really, truly understand how distinctive they are and what that means to really get an idea about how um, vintages and differences in fermentation and length of aging can affect what it is that goes on. It's like a great, I mean, a great, um, uh, introduction to that. I, I think it's more accessible. I mean, Valrona has, has got these Mule Seam collections, which are mm -hmm. um, 50 gram bars, I think, and there are three different years, but they're different origins. And yeah. so you, it's a very, very different experience for what goes on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is an opportunity um, really to get into it. And the other thing that I often say to people is that you know, the Queen of England, with all of her money, can't buy better chocolate than any of you can, <laughs> than any of us can. You, you yeah. can walk into a store. And, yeah, it's you know, true. The, the yeah. Queen's got 50 yeah. pounds and you've got 50 pounds. You know, it, it, it's all available to us. And yeah. um, even at $50 a bar, these represent things which are um, accessible. You, know, you you go, how do I go from a $20 bar of chocolate to a $50 bar of chocolate? Eh, you know, it's a big thing for many people. Whereas going mm. from a $20 bottle of wine to a $50 bottle of wine, and they can be the same bottle depending on where you buy them. Right? Sure. Um, you, know, um, uh, you know, there's this, there's this price um, inelasticity when it comes to yeah. chocolate and this, this notion that we have, which I think is a fundamental challenge going forward. Mm. Because when we talk about sustainability, one of the things we talk about, we don't talk about, is we don't talk about market sustainability. Mm. We think about sustainability in terms of environment, economics, and social, mm. and all of those things are at origin. But if you don't have the markets in, yeah. the, pla in, in the places where the chocolate is consumed, people who are willing to pony up what it is that it actually costs mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. all these sustainability efforts at origin, mm. at some point, it almost doesn't make sense to do the work. I mean, it certainly doesn't make yeah. economic sense. Yeah, economic sense. And, you, that's right. and then yeah. you got to wonder what it is that's going on. And so, uh, I, you know, one of the things here is that this exploration, I help, will really help people who don't understand what all the fuss is about mm. actually understand what all the fuss is about, <laughs> you know, that they understand why it's okay to spend a hundred dollars for a bottle of wine or a thousand dollars for a bottle mm. of wine and, you know and, and they understand that but they don't understand why it's okay to pay ten dollars for a bar of chocolate or twenty dollars mm. for a bar of chocolate and i think that if there's one thing that this has um shown to me right and where i might have been skeptical 
this time last year, I am no mm. longer skeptical about what it is that goes on. I am impressed about um, the range of what it is you've done, the subtlety, the, how well it's put together, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I applaud you know, you know, anything that you uh, can be doing to make these things uh, more accessible to more people so that they can right. get their foot in the door, <laughs> uh, the, the chocolate in their mouth, as opposed to foot yeah. in their mouth, um, <laughs> and, and, and work forward. And so I look forward to having uh, another conversation sometime mm. uh, in the next yeah, while. Thank you so as these, new, as these new products come to market, you know, please let me know. I'm really, really happy. Yeah, uh, to yeah, we can do. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to, uh, right. to learn more about them. Mm.